Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Spinning Back Click, the show that takes you on a quick spin through the week's news. On this week's show, we discuss Kamara Usman's welterweight resume and his big time call out of Jorge Masvidal. We also discuss some Bellator bracketology and look ahead to this weekend's event at UFC Fight Night 185. But guys, let's kick things off with the UFC welterweight champion Kamara Usman, who retained his title this weekend at UFC 258, then challenged Masvidal to a rematch. Now, normally we don't get the champion challenging the challenges, but what's your take on the call out, guys? And does it make sense for his next fight? We will put three minutes on the clock. And George, you can kick us off. You know, I was surprised, but it only took me like 20 seconds to realize what he was up to. First of all, when you're a champion and you've defended three times, I think you do get to call the shots. And it looks like Dana White is anxious to promote what the champ has to say. You know what I mean? So this is a money deal, guys, and Masvidal has established himself as a, as a pay-per-view star, and the champion getting those pay-per-view cuts, it's going to be really, really nice for him. Plus, he's done a pretty good job of, I wouldn't say obliterating and cleaning out completely the uh, you know the, the talent at 170, but he's knocked off some of the top cats. So in essence, I thought it was okay. He can't go up because Izzy is going up right now, and he can't go down because – there is no champion really to go up, and I don't think Habib has any interest at going to 170. I'm anxious to hear what Mike Bond's got to say. Yeah, well, I think you're completely right that he is looking at this as the best money option for him. You pretty much ran it down there. I mean, look at those welterweight rankings. Pretty much the only person Kamaru Usman has not beaten to this point is Stephen Thompson or Michael Chiesa, and I don't think they're just right there at this point in terms of a title shot. So look at what makes sense for him. I think definitely if you look at the Masvidal fight, the money is really hard to resist. That UFC 251 on Fight Island reportedly did 1.2, 1.3 million buys. And look at this card. Usman was just on UFC 258. Arguably a harder fight, a much less selling card. He probably did not make anywhere near the money in terms of this wallet being padded. So I understand completely him wanting to turn around and kind of look at this fight now. This rematch is one that makes sense for him and be able to really restore all that money. And then, as he said, I do think there is a true competitor inside Kamaru Usman, and I don't think he is satisfied with having beat Jorge Masvidal the way he did. I think he wants to put a statement on that. I think he wants to be definitive. I think his ability to do that is very likely if they fight in a rematch with full training camp. So definitely a fight I'd love to see. What about you, Dan Segura? Yeah, I, I agree with you guys. I think it's on the money from uh, you guys' part. I mean, from a sporting side, I don't think it makes much sense. But we know that MMA doesn't always abide by sporting laws. So from promotional, it does make sense. Who's the biggest name at 170 pounds, you know, out of all the contenders? Jorge Masvidal. So I think that fight makes sense if Usman is trying to improve his star power. He clearly, with that Gilbert Burns fight, proved he's a fantastic fighter and he's been doing it all along. So he doesn't really need to prove again that he deserves to be the belt. I think it's pretty clear right now that he is the best guy in that division. So if he's just trying to pump up his star power, I think the only guy available there is Jorge Masvidal. And I know that he said Masvidal has a little bit of a built-in excuse, but it's a little bit of a good way to promote that fight because, you know, Masvidal did take that fight on days and a few days notice, right? I believe it was six. So on that end, it, it kind of makes sense. And, and look, uh, you know, I, I know it's a, it's a rematch that was kind of one-sided, but with a little bit of a training camp, who's to say that Masvidal wouldn't be a little bit more competitive? Interesting to see what happens next. But speaking of Kamaru Usman, his win at the weekend saw him break GSP's record for the most consecutive welterweight wins in the UFC. Dana White said that it's undeniable that Usman will eventually surpass GSP as the greatest welterweight in UFC history. Guys, is that statement an overreaction or is it on the money? A bit of a throwback to a previous show. Give us your take on this one, guys. We'll do three more minutes on the clock for this one. And Mike, you can go first. It's somewhere in between. I can't say definitively. I think right now, this moment saying that Kamaru Usman could be or is better than George St. Pierre is an overreaction. But to say it could happen in the future is definitely on the money. The run that he is on right now, 13-0 and starting his UFC career, only Habib Nurmagomedov and Anderson Silva have done that. And those are people or two fighters people talk about in the GOAT discussion. So I definitely think Usman is making his way there. But... He only has three title defenses where we're at right now. George St. Pierre had nine in a row. He still hasn't even passed Tyron Woodley, who had four consecutive defenses. So I think right now we're talking about the all-time welterweights. Right now, Usman is somewhere in the Pat Militich, Matt Hughes type of range in terms of the all-time grades. 
But if he keeps winning, he gets two, three more title defenses, he is absolutely right there. And I think he's going to be at the forefront of that conversation of being the welterweight GOAT. What do you think, Danny? I, th I think it was an overreaction. And to be honest, it did kind of bother me to see on the broadcast how they were already comparing him to GSP. And look, I have all the respect in the world for Kamaru Usman. I think he's a fantastic talent. I think the evolution that he showed at UFC 258 was incredible. I mean, we're used to seeing this guy with great ground and pound, heavy wrestling, great athlete, great pressure. And all of a sudden, he's got some badass striking. Obviously, you know, that's the only thing we can expect from his work with Trevor Whitman. But let's be real here. GSP is not only the best fighter to ever compete at 170 pounds, but also probably the goat in this sport. I mean, he's achieved so much, right? Two belts in different weight classes. Long, long 10 years of defending the belt. Usman certainly has the potential to get up there and get in the discussion of being among the very, very best. But I think as of now, he's, he's still far from it. But look, it's also uh, worth noting that there is a lot of work to be done. We're comparing somebody that already finished his career versus someone who's in, his, in the middle of his prime. So let's wait and see. And I think this question is better suited for uh, a few title defenses down the line. You know, Dana White tends to be in this bulletproof car uh, where he can say things and then we all go, he's a promoter. He, he's doing his job. He overreacted. This is an overreaction here um, because it's not undeniable. Like Mike Bond stated, this is only his third title defense. He's looked great, by the way. 18-1 and overall, 13-0 and in the UFC. I have no problem with it. This guy definitely is destined for the Hall of Fame. But, again, Tyron Woodley had four. Pat Milicic had four. Matt Hughes had seven. In one of those runs, he had five because he was a multiple-time uh, champion. But GSP's at nine. So, undeniable i mean geez so many things could happen if he defends twice a year we're still three and a half years away from seeing if he can accomplish the feat of just tying just be to get the 10 he's going to need seven more i don't know guys I, I don't know that it's undeniable he's headed that way everything looks good but i i don't know that it's undeniable i think dana white overreacted and i'm not going to give him the pass of the of him being a promoter he just overreacted it just goes to show what kind of resume GSP built over the course of that incredible UFC career. A lot of wins to pick up before he can catch up, I think. But last week, guys, we had some big Bellator news. They unveiled, unveiled rather, their eight-man light heavyweight Grand Prix tournament. Now, we know the brackets already. We know the first-round matchups already. So put your predicting hats on, guys, and let's have your way-too-early tournament predictions. Who's going to make the final, and who's going to walk away the Bellator light heavyweight champion. We'll do three minutes on the clock. And Danny, you get the luxury of going first. Thank you. Uh, look, I think this is a great tournament. First of all, before we go into the, the crazy predictions here, Bellator absolutely killed it with this uh, tournament, the announcement, everything, the matchups. They got everything absolutely right. And I'm excited and looking forward to this tournament. Really, really bad here in, in April that it kicks off. But um, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I think the two best fighters there are Anthony Rumble Johnson and Joel Romero. Um, I think the winner of that fight will probably win the whole tournament. So I'm, I'm looking at the winner of, of that fight to be the next uh, champion and to be crowned the, the champion at the Grand Prix. However, I do understand that Vadim Nemkov is a very a special talent. He's yet a little bit unproven for my taste, so it's hard for me to put my money on Vadim Nemkov. But I wouldn't be surprised if he actually ends up keeping his belt throughout the whole thing and winning it. But for now, I'm going to go with Rumble Johnson. I think he beats Romero. Just more power, more technique, bigger size. And I think that within itself, all those facts that I said, will carry over in any matchup that he uh, finds himself in in the Bellator Grand Prix. So I think, man, okay, that's a great question. Who do I think and what's best for business? I, who do I think? My final four is Beta versus Anderson and Johnson versus Davis. A little switch around of what I thought initially because I thought it through a little bit. But I think in the finals, Anthony Johnson's going to beat Ryan Bader. And guess what? I also think that's the best possible scenario for Bellator. They can at least fight again because Bader has the heavyweight title. And Johnson has aspired, I think, to do some great things in this final run of his. So I, I think that's probably the best thing. Plus, they're spending a lot of money for these guys. Romero, Johnson, somebody's got to win. I like them putting them together. Uh, but I think Johnson and Bader is probably the best case scenario for Bellator. And I think that's what's going to happen. Uh, Mike Bond, if you like him, man, I got March Madness picks. Well, what do you think of these? No love for Dalvit Shog Yag Shimuradov. I don't even know if I'm saying the name right, but this man is, <laughs> I think, a uh, overlooked proponent in this tournament. But no, 
all seriousness, I think this is a great lineup from Bellator. They knocked it out of the park. Uh, some of the established people, you know, some of the slightly lesser knowns. I'm not going to try to repeat the name again, but a lot of fun matchups there. I think they kind of did the brackets right and everything, and there's a lot of storylines going into this. Like, of course, I think the fight in general, we're all most interested in seeing what happens is Yoel Romero and Anthony Johnson. Uh, I'm very glad they made that right off the bat. It was the right promotional move. With those guys, you just, there's no guarantees that they're going to meet later in the tournament, but I think when we do see our final, I agree with George. I think it's maybe a, a Ryan Bader slash Corey Anderson against maybe Anthony Johnson. But I don't know, man. Like I think it's a putting a lot of investment in Anthony Johnson, thinking he might get through this whole tournament after not having seen him for so long. But if he can get back some of that knockout power we saw in the UFC, it's going to be very, very big trouble for every single person in this tournament. It is going to be a lot of fun following that tournament through 2021. And to finish off this week, guys, this weekend's fight card at UFC Fight Night 185 is packed with rising prospects and seasoned veterans looking to make a statement in their first appearances of the year. So to finish off this week's show, I want to know the one fighter on the card who you think could walk away having stolen the show on Saturday night. Who's the one name everyone's got to look out for on Saturday? We'll just do a quick fire round to finish off. So we'll put two minutes on the clock. And George, you can go first. Well, I think the one to look for is Katlyn Vera. For one, I love the matchup with her and Yana Kunitskaya, but she's got a nice record of 11-1. and one. She did have that setback versus Irene Aldana that, you know, hurts. And this is a division where, for one, you have a champion in two different weight classes. She'll, she only stops by and checks in on you once a year, maybe. And let's not forget, Holly Holm, GDR, they're not throwing in the towel yet. They're still fighting. Aspen Ladd's going to come back soon. Juliana Pena saying, hey, what about me? So Kaylin Vera has to win this weekend because otherwise she's going to tumble like two years out of title contention. I think she's going to get the job done, though, but it's going to be tough. Man, I think uh, this is a, a tricky one. It's a nice card in there, but uh, I think if Curtis Blades is going to win this main event too, it's going to give a lot of other opportunity for people to have storylines and whatnot come up with them just because of the you know the nature of how he might win here. But I do like a look at Andre Arlovsky, man. I know he's the grizzled veteran, but this is going to be his 34th UFC fight. It's remarkable that he's still around and still doing his thing, and he'll be looking for, I believe, a three-fight winning streak here. So that's just incredible that Arlovsky continues to do his thing at his best stage and he's got you know a teammate of Darren Till a very good up-and-comer and Tom Aspinall standing across the cage so I, I do like that fight and I think for me Arlovsky even though his fights haven't been the most beautifully entertaining or anything like that this late career run he's going on it just is always compelling to me as someone who's been following the sport for so long I'm gonna go with uh, Danny Chavez and not because his name is Danny and he's also Colombian but look he had an impressive featherweight debut he's fighting a really tough guy in Jared Gordon and uh, he's been looking good so far. He's he's training out of MMA Masters, which absolutely has been killing it with Ilya Toporia, right? Miguel Baeza and a few other names. So I got my eye on Danny Chavez. I think he could do great things in the featherweight division and uh, keep an eye on him because he's, he's a fun fighter to follow for sure. I can't let this pass without flying the flag for Mr. Tom Aspinall. He has got superb hands and fast hands for the heavyweight division. That fight with Arlovsky could be an absolute banger. Do not take your eyes off it. That is definitely one to make sure you're not having a pee break for. Right, that is our show done and dusted this week. Don't forget you can follow full coverage of UFC Fight Night 185 all week right here at MMA Junkie. Enjoy the fights this weekend, guys, and we'll be back next week. <laughs>